Yeah, he would uh, rally, you, you know, thousands and thousands. You know, not only NOI. Would it say like, you know, but apparently he never got any response from Dr. King. So, um, later that day, I'm talking about still June 30th, 1964, he flew to Omaha, Nebraska, the place where he was born, a horrendous place. Upon the invitation of the city's Citizens Coordinating Committee for Civil Liberties, upon arrival, he kept up his provocative banter charging that in Omaha, as in other places, the KKK has just challenged, it's just changed its bed sheets for police uniforms. After addressing the, the local audience at Omaha City's auditorium, he checked out of his hotel at 3 a.m. And, and the writer don't say, this is the place where they burned down his house as a child. They woke up in, in the middle of flames. It's just, this is why I hate sometimes scholars, you know, because they are very cold. They are very cold, just like when he talked about Miss Betty Shabazz saying that, oh, she was... She was a bourgeois, she was this and that. Uh, it was a miracle she was able to get out in the street again after what she witnessed with her daughters. But there was, there's no, it don't matter. This is, this is for me, this is a, a, a crucial part of, um, of his life. I don't think, I don't know, I don't think this was the first time he was back, you know, but just to think about it, you know, the circle right there, you know, coming back to speak, uh, speak an engagement. So she, he checked out at 3 in the morning. At 3 in the morning. He probably couldn't even sleep. Just having the memories. Being back in a horrible place. Which, by the way, we must rescue that, that house. You know, one of the houses that, that he lived in. And later that morning was in downtown Chicago. That's fear. That's fucking fear. <laughs> His scheduled events practically impossible to get to. You know, well back then, you know, airlines had more reliable reliability. It was more like you know, an experience, you know, to fly. He was, he was a calling guest on a local radio program which alerted thousands of angry NOI members that he was in the city. So, He's not thinking, you know, like normal. That's no normal thinking. You know, that's that's just crazy, crazy thought, you know, going to Chicago. I mean, like... <sighs> Although he, he confirmed he would appear on the Chicago television show of the cuff, he never made it to the station. 
threats on his life now openly expressed on the streets force him to return immediately to New York. At the beginning of July, Malcolm, former fiancé Evelyn uh, Williams and Lucille Rosary filed paternity lawsuits. Yeah, well, this is, this is different. Oh, here's another one. Where you go? On the night, one night in early July, either the 3rd or the 4th of July, Malcolm contacted the NYPD alerting them. This is the story I'm telling you that, <clears throat> that he was going home. So he saw no NYPD officers present, <clears throat> but what he could see was two unfamiliar men approach his car on foot. He quickly accelerated driving around the block and waiting before going home. Malcolm complained to the police and an officer was eventually placed in front of the residence, but only for 24 hours. That's how, you know, that's how you know they did it. That's how you know they did it, you know. I mean, his house should have never been bombed. You know, if, the, if there was police around, come on. <clears throat> Despite this intimidation, Malcolm was not about to become a political fugitive in his own city. The next evening, the African American, the Organization for African American Unity, <clears throat> sponsor its second public rally again at the Audubon. Although most uh, um, Muslim mosques incorporated, which was the other organization of his, members did not belong to the OAAU, the Organization of African American Unity, Benjamin 2X Goldman was handed the assignment to introduce Malcolm to the audience. Malcolm informed his audience, right now things are pretty hard for me, you know. Oh yes, I may sound like I'm cracking, but I'm facting. On July 8, Malcolm X appeared again <clears throat> on the Barry, G Barry G Gray show in New York. On July 9, he carried on correspondence with Hassan Sharif, the dissident son of Ethel and Raymond Sharif, who had recently broken with, uh, with and denounced the nation. Malcolm wrote to him saying he was unable to send Sharif funds, but pledged he would assist him in organizing the believers in Philadelphia, Chicago, and other cities behind Brother Wallace Mohammed. Malcolm had reached a point where his own physical safety was secondary to the realization of his political effectiveness. Chief among them were first forging a Pan-African alliance between the newly independent African states. Which, I mean, just imagine that. This is the, like, you know, so much going. You know, we have Salma in the south and, uh, you know, African countries start to gain their independence. It's just so exciting times, you know, but at the same time, it's uh, the most dangerous times, you know. <clears throat> and not consolidating the, the Muslim Mass Incorporated's relationships with officials in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the entire Muslim world. Both goals require him to head overseas. So that's, that's, that's why, you know, it was planned. Um, so it was both. It was the, the Muslim... Mask Incorporated and 
the Organization for African American Unity. So this second trip aboard that year will also remove him from the nation's direct line of fire. Perhaps he figured the vicious jihad the nation had waged against him might abate after a long absence outside the United States. On the evening on July 9, traveling as Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm boarded, boarded TWA Flight 700 for London. Arriving the next morning, Malcolm held an impromptu press conference in which he charged that the United States government is violating the United Nations Charter by violating our basic human rights. Imagine just that. This was not even a week. This was not even a week. He was a Omaha, Nebraska, you know, assassination attempts going on and uh, had to flee Chicago. I mean, it, it just, you know, insane. I mean, 007, it's boring compared. I mean, if somebody was ever to make a movie, uh, you, you know, about a good movie, not just some bullshit that they make today, you know. <clears throat> he also predicted that in the summer of 1964, America will see a, a bloodbath. Malcolm d deeply believed in the power of prophecy and only days after his departure from New York, the violence he had long worn of in his speeches finally erupted on the streets of Harlem. On July 18, the police with the, the, the police shooting of a, a, a fi black 15-year-old sparked an angry march that ended with the crowd surrounding the 123rd Street uh, uh, NYPD precinct the same station where Malcolm had led the Johnson Hinton protest in 1957. Only this time when the police started making arrests, the people fought back. Others ran through Harlem business district, smashing windows and stealing everything they could carry. Of course, he he, he, they, he had to put this here. And I'm saying he, when I'm talking about, it's the FBI. So nobody talk about these uh, July 18 riots in Harlem in 1964. In London, though, ready for a, a mo momentous street trip, he could not have imagined such particulars. After renting a hotel room for the night, Malcolm rang one of his contacts who provided him with telephone numbers and other contacts in information for some African leaders. <laughs> this is like, I mean, I mean, if you see this in a movie, you say like, oh, this is fiction. No, but he was like, Right there from, from this tiny little world in Harlem into like the world stage calling presidents. I mean, it's just insane. So where was I? Um, in his hotel lobby, Malcolm managed to attract three British journalists to do a 20-minute interview. The next day, July 11, he was off to Cairo. This is something that, you know, he don't understand. Or, or uh, I mean, whoever is like, is saying like, oh, he was giving interviews and saying this over there. He was in, 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 um, in London and then in Cairo. And then, and this is like, and he was like contradicting. I mean, that's stupid. You know, especially, first of all, there was no internet back then. So, so you had to think, you know, the way things is like you, you are painting something in the whole world. 
So you give a, a broad stroke over here, a broad stroke over there, and it'll mean, you know, but he was stupid. He, he said that in the book several times. That's why, that's why I'm saying this, you know. <clears throat> the next day, July 11, 1964, he was off to Cairo. Malcolm's greatest strength was his ability to speak on, on behalf of those to whom society and state had denied a voice due to a racial prejudice. He understood these yearnings and anticipated these actions. He could now see the possibility he could now see the possibility of a future without racism for his people. But what he could not anticipate were the terrible dangers closest to him in the forms of both betrayal and death. Just days prior to Malcolm's return to, to Africa, Max Stanford recalled 45 years later, Malcolm had introduced Max to Charles 37X uh, Cañara, a, a member of his inner circle at the, the private reception. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a different story. Yeah, that, that, that's a different story. Yeah, he was a piece of work too. But uh, where, is the, where is the, oh, here it is the story. We're going back to July 12th. Uh, the Malcolm arrived in Cairo after midnight on July 12th and stayed initially at the Semiri, Semiramis Hotel in, in, in the days that follow as he waited for his clearance to attend the the um, a the OAU the the Organization of African Unity Conference I think that's what it's called as an observer he occupied his time by getting settled in and making uh, contact with key, key leaders the evening after his arrival he contacted Dr. Sh Shawarbi, who was so eager to engage him in political conversation that he and a small entourage of mostly African Americans drove over to his hotel, where they talked together until 3 in the morning. Malcolm also met with a number of dignitaries, including the Kenyan political leader Tom and Boya, as well as Hassan Sam Al Kali, Kali, director of Nasser Nasser's Bureau of General Affairs, and he and he dined with Shirley Graham Dubois, <clears throat> whom he previously met in Ghana. He visited Cairo University, the pyramids, and other sites with the ABC cameraman in tow and he gave interviews to the London Observer and the, and the United Press. Once at the conference he immediately began to circulate memorandum calling upon newly independent African nations to condemn the United States for its violations of black human rights. Can you imagine that? <laughs> imagine you know, Malcolm X with these, you know, uh, writings. I don't think there was, I don't know if there was photocopies. I guess it was photocopies or something. He printed out. So he was like, he was giving everybody <coughs> from, you know, under the table. It's like, this is what we're going to do. This, this is what we're going to do. And it's just like, Who can do that? Who can do that? This was his second, third time in Africa. And, and he was already, he got everybody's trust. He got everybody's, you know. <clears throat> and
and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but but you know, even they they recognize that had they actually um, had a chance to, um, you know, I I read this a while back, so I really don't don't remember um, what happened. But let me see. Uh, Oh, he said here, he, in the end, Malcolm failed to persuade through not for any great flaw in his arguments or ebbing of his passion. His radically simply could not overcome the cold logic of international politics. Yeah, that, that was just, but what if it could have worked? Why this is this is why we got to keep trying, got to keep trying, keep trying. You don't know when it's gonna work. <clears throat> in the bipolar political world, in the of the 1960s, back in a formal resolution that sharply condemned the United States for its domestic human rights violation, would have been seen by the American government as an act of partnership with the Soviet Union or the Ch the Communist Chinese. Yeah, it's always the boogeyman, the boogeyman. So it's like that, that, just that fear of being, being put in, 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 you know, like, like you are in, in you know, an associate of uh, these two countries. It's just like, it really prevents from a lot because, I mean, Cuba is still standing. <clears throat> And I was reading too that that that, that this was this was a form of terrorism. Countries will be uh, uh, accused of being communist, of being like this, and uh, like I'm talking about brand new countries. They just got their independence months ago, and uh, it just had they had the guts, you know, they would have been able to contain this monster. So. Let me go, let me just go back to let me go to the let me go to the the next one. Um, so, uh, he's talking about a, a Che Guevara on page three ninety four um, that. You know that they both had a lot of um, uh, report, and they was both avid avid readers of each other. <clears throat> they was following each other in the news, and uh, because that's what you gotta do. So you don't wanna work against um, the tactics. It's about communication and the, the strategies of. Um, of um, you, you you know had to be had to be uh, synchronized you know okay so I'm just gonna go to where I because I get the, I get um, so. This is on December um, 12th, I think it's like, I mean, it's keep back and forth, you know, throughout the, the whole book, so. <clears throat> so just, just so you, so you see, he, he was talking about um, the exposing how the, you know, he spoke again about the bombings of uh, Congolese villages carried out by Belgian mercenaries and American trained anti-Castro Cuban pilots while the United States was you know uh, selling a different story that it was of the people it was the people who actually you know um, carried out these these attacks so So, 
to Malcolm's excitement, Ernesto Che Guevara, the former, the former guerrilla, guerrilla, guerrilla leader of the Cuban Revolution, swept, swept into town to address um, the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 11. At that moment, Guevara was perhaps Malcolm's closest analog <clears throat> on the world stage. A, a relentless supported of the struggles of oppressed people and committed revolutionary. Like Malcolm, he was deeply concerned about ongoing and recent events in Africa in making broad connections between the Cuban revolution and other struggles around the, the globe. He had a special mention to to the painful case of the Congo, unique in modern history, <clears throat> that show how the rights of the people can be thwarted, thwarted with the utmost impunity. He, he in, insisted that the root <clears throat> of the Congo's misery was that nations in, in immense wealth which the imperialist nations went to to keep on the want to keep under their control in a language markedly similar to Malcolm Malcolm's he described the dynamics of neocolonialism as forms of military and economic collaboration between Western powers who committed those crimes Bel Belgian paratroopers brought by the United brought in the by United States planes which left from English bases. All free men in the world should prepare to avenge the crime in the Congo. Malcolm invited Guevara to address the Organization of African-American Unity rally at the Audubon on December 13, but the Argentine declined to attend, concerned that his presence might be seen as provocative for foray into the internal U.S. politics. Still, many of the, game, of the themes Guevara addressed, had, addre had addressed at the United Nations were central to the discussion that evening, especially when Malcolm took the stage to fill time after Tanzanian minister, who also happened to be in New York for the General Assembly, was late in arriving. Can you imagine that? You know, a president is late and Malcolm X fill in for the president of Tanzania. This is just... I don't know how common that is for somebody who was a minister. Who was somebody who was, you know... This is... Oh, wow. We are living in a revolutionary world and in a revolutionary age. Malcolm told the overflowing crowd, numbering at least 500, and by some reports, many more. We must realize, he said, that is the direct connection between the struggle of the Afro-American in this country and the struggle of our world, of our people, all over the world. For those who might suggest resolving the racial crisis in Mississippi before worrying about the Congo, he warned, you'll never get Mississippi straightened out, not until you start realizing your connection with the Congo. His argument defined Pan-Africanist logic, but also ran deep in light of the imperialist connections 
that Guevara had drawn at the United Nations. Underlying Malcolm's main argument about the unity of black struggle was an important point about explo exploitation. The connection with the Congo for, for black Americans had as much to do with the commonly, com commonality of economic oppression as it did with race. It was this leap from race and specific ideas to broader ones about class, politics, and economics that pushed Malcolm thinking forward in late 1964, a lesson that his travels in Africa had brought, brought into focus. Yet, he continued to have difficulty co conveying the change in his thinking to Harlem audiences, often because of his reliance on, on an older, cumbersome political language that lumped nearly all whites into a hostile group. I don't think that's, you know... Anyway... So that's that's what um